I, I've had the, the, the great joy of being able to come back um, in the middle of last week from almost seven weeks of long service leave. And we, um, I, I've come back, you know, I, I look at it and I figure if Jesus himself needed to take time out and go rest at times, then we probably need to do it as well. And hopefully that's a little bit of what this weekend is about. But I've come back feeling very much refreshed and, and ready to go again. But it's, it's fascinating the places that we, we hooked on the caravan and, and went up through um, western New South Wales and into western Queensland and north Queensland and, and all over. Um, met some fascinating people along the way. And um, oh, I might share one or two more things tomorrow on that. But one of the places we, we stopped at was not this lighthouse. That was another journey and another photo that I took. But this is... Helps if I have that on. There we go. This is one of the places we stopped at on the, the way as we travelled north. And if you don't recognise that, it looks a bit like a moonscape, which is pretty good description of it in places. There's a bit more of a, a, a close-up. But as you travel around this place, you come across things like this. Lightning Ridge it is, well done. So Lightning Ridge, of course, is an opal mining um, spot in Australia. Um, outside of the, the main township itself, I'm sure there's no building code or, or you know, anything. It's just this quirky, um, weird, weird place. And as you, you drive around, um, you come across um, places like this. Now, no one lives in that one. That's out near, there's, there's where I got the, the early photos there is a, is a lookout, and this is just near there. I don't know whether anyone ever has lived in it, but it's, as you can see, somebody's done a lot of drinking to build that building. Um, that's just another angle on it. And as you go through, this is out, out near the lookout, so somebody's built this maze out of rocks just because you can. Um, and then, of course, Around every corner almost, there seems to be some old bomb like this. And combine that with the, the car doors that are on the, the corners to, to direct you around. That's how it really, you know, that's how you find your way around Lightning Ridge. This is Fred Bodell's camp. Um, we, we came to be there. Somebody actually lived in that once upon a time. Not currently, but um, it's, it's just this shanty that... They, they obviously set up because what was important was the mining of the opals. The opals was everything. And um, I'll tell you more about that. We, we had a little bit of a go at, at fossicking for opals. I can say my wife enjoyed it. She obviously is much more patient than I. You know, this scrapping around in the dust and the dirt, finding these little scraps of... Anyway... D didn't do it for me, but as we drove around and we, we got a tour, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but you know, this is just set up on, on the side of out somebody's house and you think, well, there's a story to this. I didn't find out this story, but obviously had one. Um, of an evening, we'd go down to the artesian boar bars. The artesian boar bars are spectacular. You, you sit there in, in the darkness in this hot, um, water, this is obviously not a, um, it's a long exposure on my camera and it's just, you know, it's free. I, I can switch to the other mic, Henry, if that would be better or persist. We'll persist, all right. Um, and then you, you get to look up at that. Um, it is just, you know, those, those, Outback stars, that dark sky, um, just absolutely beautiful. But I want to introduce you to this guy. This guy is Len Cram. Len is one of the original opal miners at Lightning Ridge. I met him at the Seventh-day Adventist church in Lightning Ridge. He's an Adventist. He also happens to be probably one of, if not the, most prominent expert on opals in the world, and he's an Adventist. 
He's written a four-volume encyclopedia of opals. And when a little later in our journeys we, we turned up in, in Winton where they mine boulder opal rather than the, the opal they mine um, here at Lightning Ridge, there in one of the opal dealers is sitting the four-volume encyclopedia of Len Cram. So, you know, th this guy is, is pretty special when it comes to opals. He took us into... Um, because I happened to be a pastor that turned up at church on Sabbath, they, they roped me into preaching, which was great. Um, and so the, 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 the payment in kind, I think, was Len said, hey, come, come drop in on Sunday and I'll give you a tour. And we got this magnificent tour of Lightning Ridge and found out things we'd have never found out otherwise about Lightning Ridge. But in his, his little shed out the back, Len is this very smart guy that's worked out how opals are formed, and these are man-made opal. Um, so Len, Len took us out to, to one particular spot in Lightning Ridge. You know, it, there's, there's a park in Lightning Ridge. It's the Len Cram Park. This is, this is the sort of influence he, he has in this town. And he, he said to us, because we, we started asking him about, you know, how he got into to mining opals. And he said, have you ever been in love? Yeah. Well, he said, when you get opal fever, it's worse than being in love. <laughs> I didn't get it. I'll stick with being in love. That's good. Um, <clears throat> but Len... Len um, started to, to tell us lots of stories as we rent, went round, and as he took us to this particular spot, now council owned land beside the, the airstrip at Lightning Ridge, he said, I'm going to tell you a story and you'll use this one day. Well, one day arrived pretty quick. Len said, I've only ever had two dreams in my life that were significant. He didn't tell us the other one. But he said, I dreamt that here under this spot was a great opal find. And he said, you know, as, uh, and he didn't, if I remember correctly, he didn't just have the dream once, he had the dream twice. That here under this spot that we were standing at that point was a, was a great find of opal. And apparently at Lightning Ridge, the, the, you know, you've got these opal seams that go through, but where, where the ground has broken and drops down and then continues on, in that spot there is where the best opal is found. Len, however, was, was busy. He had other claims that he was working. He was, um, you know, he's been quite active in the church, been active in the Adventist Aviation Association and, and you know, different things as far as church goes. Um, and, and somehow along the way, once he'd had this dream, he, he didn't get the time to get to this spot. He, he procrastinated over it. And he had always intended to, to come and mine this spot. But he never got the time. He never quite got there. And then the airstrip was built and it became council land and... You know, now if you were to mine that spot, you'd probably be committing some criminal offence. But the story gets better. So he has this dream, this spot, this, this place that he, he should have mined, that he should have, you know, found the opal in. Now he's about, I think he, he said he's about 87 or 88, you know, fit, wiry, tough. Um, you know, he gave us the rules of Lightning Ridge. Don't ask anyone's surname. Don't ask where the beat come from. Um, you know, if you go skinny dipping in the artesian bore bars, you can only do that after midnight. They're the, you know, some of the, the lightning ridge rules. We didn't go after midnight. Um, a few years ago, some, some Russian scientists came out to, to lightning ridge and came looking for, for Len because they'd heard about what Len had, you know, some of the things he'd written. And they, they, they actually were coming to, to ask him to, to pick his brains as far as his knowledge goes, but also to, to ask him to come and lecture at a university in Russia, which he, he didn't. But they came with this fancy ground-penetrating radar. So guess where they went? 
to that spot that we were standing as we were telling the story. And they set up their, you know, their fancy equipment and they, they go over this ground. And Len said, you know what? There's opal under here. The, the topography of the, the, the land is perfect for good opal. But he never mined it because he never got around to it. And now it will never be mined. It makes me think, you know, this, this weekend you'll hear about purpose. That's, that's our theme that runs through the weekend. But I just want to think for a moment about the enemy of purpose. Because there are many things that are an enemy to purpose and procrastination is, is one of the big ones. We intend to read the Bible through in a year. We intend to do more for God. Not that that earns our favour with him or anything. We've already got that. But we, we intend to, to do you know, significant things in our life or in church or at work. But I don't have the time this week. You know, this week I've got this on and that commitment and that and somehow a week slips into a month and a month slips into a year and a year slips into a decade and somehow we never fulfil the purpose. We never mine the opal that we, we dreamt was there. And when I, I come to Scripture, and we'll do that in a moment, it's probably no surprise that over and over again you have people stand up, particularly as they get towards the end of their life and start talking about what's important. People like Solomon, who tries everything and does everything and writes an almost depressing book in Ecclesiastes but comes to a brilliant conclusion at the end of it because he's, he's done it all. And he knows now what matters. You have Joshua who stands up at the end of his life. You know the speech, the final speech he makes to the people of Israel. You know, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But his emphasis is choose this day. When Len told the story... Um, and said I'd use it one day. I didn't, you know, didn't know when I'd use the story. Um, but it just, you know, it, it typifies so much of what happens. Somebody gave me a book a few years ago, Bill Heibel's book called Simplify. I was going to read it. But I didn't have the time. And I never actually got to reading the book until one day... Another friend gave me the audio version of it. And so as I probably drove from Melbourne to Swan Hill or whatever it was, I had this on and, and listened to it. And actually I got some really good things out of it. And it made, made me think, sometimes we, we, we probably have to be creative if we have a purpose and we seem unable to achieve it one way maybe there's another way that it can be achieved one of the things that stood out as i listened to this book was was he said we don't achieve much in a year but in three four five years we can achieve an awful lot and we can do it simply by putting it on our calendar and repeatedly coming back to it until we've achieved it and, and, you know, he told stories of people who had been down and out, you know, single mums who had no qualifications, who just started, you know, that, that putting it on the calendar one step at a time and one year's time their circumstances weren't much different but in five years' time they had a qualification and a good job just because they'd set about doing it. There's two stories in, in Scripture that I just want to contrast quickly with you. And one is a man we know very well who grabbed the moment and took the moment. And the other is, in a way, a story of procrastination. The first is Matthew 19. 
Matthew 19 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, it says, Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honour your father and mother and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Interesting that he actually recognises that there's, you know, he's, that there's something still lacking. And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give, it, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. It's interesting when you look at this in the the different Gospels, it's just Matthew that has the next sentence. And Matthew records it by saying, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. The moment was there. That was the the moment that he could take that step and his life could have changed. He could have fulfilled the purpose that God put him on earth. But instead, whether he wasn't ready, whether he couldn't do it, whether he went away with the intention of doing it later, he goes away sad because it's not yet. And yet then we contrast that with another man in another place also in the Gospels, not John 19, but Luke 19. Right at the beginning of the chapter, it's a story that if you are or have been a kid's Sabbath school leader, you'll know the song. What's the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So the story sounds very similar to what we've just read. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, again, if anyone had an excuse to procrastinate, he had all the good reasons here. He couldn't get, you know, he couldn't get through the crowd. He couldn't see over the crowd. You know the story. He had all the reasons in the world, but nothing was going to get in his way. Because finally, there was one that could help him see things and know things and be the man that God had always intended him to be, but he'd never been brave enough to do. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to the guest of us, to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man, notice purpose, for the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Purpose. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. We're here because we believe he's given us a commission to seek and save that which was lost. And this weekend, we retreat. We have this magnificent time together. And when you go back to your churches and your homes, life will be busy. There'll be the mundane things that will come back in to to distract us. But don't forget the purpose God has put us on earth. That is what matters. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much that you've given us this beautiful place. We pray that you will daily hold us true to our purpose, 
that we won't be distracted because of wealth or busyness or whatever it be, Lord. You know there are any number of distractions. But Lord, help us not to procrastinate. Help us to make the most important things the most important things. Help us to to keep foremost the call that you came and lived out to seek and save the lost. So thanks, Lord. Thanks for your word. Thanks for those that have come to share this weekend. And Lord, thanks for the food that we're going to eat uh, for breakfast in a moment as well. May you bless the food and bless this time we have together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.